So if you are trying to do an elemental analysis or you're trying to use EDS, which is also called EDX, EDAX, um, EDXS, uh, etc. Um, if you are trying to use that, then we are going to, after having positioned ourselves properly, we are going to open up Pathfinder. This is another software here on the desktop called Pathfinder right here. And I'm going to open that up. And Pathfinder is automatically going to ask us to save a project. And it works within a project folder. So what you do is you create the project folder and then every image or every scan that you take is going to auto save to that folder. So to give it a location, if you're logged into the network, that is the M drive here, you're going to find the machine that we're on. We're gonna open user data. There's a lot of information in user data. And you're gonna scroll down to your folder and save a project under there. You can see some of these have green on them. Green means, oops, green means that there are there is EDS data within those folders. What I typically will do is click on the parent folder, create a new project, and I will name it something with EDS in the name. Penny EDS. Um, what that's going to do is that's going to specify that this is an EDS Pathfinder project folder rather than just some other folder um, such as like training. Um, by calling it EDS, I'm not going to accidentally save files within this folder, which does have the potential to kind of throw off our software here. So you want to make sure that you specify this is a project folder and not some, uh, some random folder that we've created. So I'm going to open this project. You can also open old projects that you've worked on in the past um, and keep working within those projects. There are three different things that we can do within Pathfinder. We can take a spectrum, which is going to give us a percent composition of our surface. That is going to take information over the entirety of this screen. So it'll tell me percent composition of this screen. If this is not what you want to see, you'll want to position yourself in such a way that you are actually learning percent composition of the area of your interest. The next one is point ID. That is where it takes a picture of this screen here you choose points on the screen for it to take information. So I would take maybe a point here and a point over here. And it will give you information on the compositional uh, makeup of both of these two points. The last one is spectral imaging, better known as mapping. Um, this is going to give you dots of color that correspond to different elements on the surface eventually giving you a map of color based on the locations of different elements on your surface. For a, a homogeneous surface, mapping is going to be completely useless. However, if you are looking at a boundary between two elements, or as we're looking at here, chunks of contamination on the surface, mapping can be very informative. For Spectrum, we're going to start by clicking on Spectrum, obviously being in the right mode. Click on the gear, and we're going to set these criteria right here. The termination criteria is how long it runs. I tend to like to have it run until the upper peak is a thousand counts tall, um, and I typically set live time limit to zero. If you have values in both of these boxes, it will stop at whichever one happens first. So it will either collect for 30 seconds or until it hits, hits a thousand counts, whichever one happens first. Um, so for that reason, I typically will set one and I will set the other to zero so it ignores that one. Um, if you would like, you can also just have all of them collect for 60 seconds and set max peak counts to zero. That means each one will work uh, up to 60 seconds. For speed of training, we're going to do just 30 seconds on each scan and set our max peak counts to zero. Next, we're going to 
set or we're going to glance at our energy range. This means that the x-axis is going to go from 200 EV up to auto, which is our default here. Um, <clears throat> you can go a little bit lower than 200 EV. Um, if you are really interested in seeing uh, boron in your sample, you can go a little lower than 200 since boron's peak happens around uh, 190, I believe, 183. Um, however, you don't want to go below 150, um, otherwise you start including beryllium. Our EDS detector has a beryllium window on it, so if you allow it to include beryllium as an element that is on your sample, it will tell you that everything is made of beryllium because it's looking through a beryllium window. Um, kind of like if you're looking through a red piece of glass, everything appears red. Um, to our detector, everything is beryllium. So for that, case, for that reason, we tell it to start at 200 EV, so it kind of ignores beryllium. It also ignores boron, and it starts at carbon. Finally, we're going to set time constant to rate 1. Once you have these set up, click Start Spectrum, and it is going to prompt you to put in some information. This information is what accelerating voltage you're using. Um, on our SEM, we can only use up to 15 kV. That should normally be set to 15. Um, I don't know why it was set to 200 just now. We're also going to check what our magnification is and our working distance. We're going to do that by bringing up the imaging software and looking down here at the scale bar. This D right here, where it says D 6.3, that is our working distance, so we are 6.3 millimeters between the detector and the surface of our sample, and this is our magnification, 180x. So 6.3 and 180, magnification, 180, working distance, 6.3. Those are the only things you need to pay attention to, so I'm gonna hit go ahead and click close. Um, before I click close, because this is a good reminder to me to do this, I'm going to make sure that I'm in the right mode on my imaging software. I'm in 15 kV, which is not bad, that's good, but even better is I want to be in EDX mode. Anytime I change modes, I'm going to verify that I'm nice and focused before I move on. So I'm going to just do a little bit of refinement here. Oh yeah. A little better focused there. Okay, I'm gonna go back to 180 because I like that zoom. Actually, I like 200. Um, so EDX mode, like I mentioned earlier, is going to be 15 kV, but it is a higher uh, beam current, meaning we're getting more electrons hitting the surface of our sample than we had before. Um, so this was a good reminder to me um, to change into EDX mode. It's not going to harm anything if you're not in EDX mode, but it will make your scans take a lot longer and get a lot. You'll get a lot uh, lower resolution, basically. You changed the magnification, right? I oh, I did change the magnification. Thank you, cameraman. Um, and actually, because I changed my focus, my working distance changed just a little bit. So now I'm at 6.4 instead of 6.4. In spectrum mode, these two things don't matter as much. In point ID and mapping or spectral imaging, those are going to be very important that I have those updated. If at any point I change those values again, I can get this dialog box back by clicking anywhere along the bottom bar here where it says working distance, magnification, and accelerating voltage. Okay, I'm gonna click close and it's going to go into a collection mode here. And it is going to collect for approximately 30 seconds. You can see we've got a timer up here. And what's nice is it's gonna auto identify as many elements as it can. Surprise, surprise, there's copper on our penny. Um, also not surprising is carbon and oxygen. Probably there's a little bit of rust on the surface of our penny, so probably we've got a little oxide. Carbon is basically everywhere, um, so we've probably, you know, from touching it, um, from dust falling on it, that's not terribly surprising to me. Aluminum, chlorine, and potassium, you can see these are very, very tiny peaks. 
And it's possible that those aren't there at all. Um, with those peaks being so small, we're definitely within a range where we're uncertain about those. However, these are pretty common things to have on your skin. Um, aluminum, chlorine, and potassium come from water, come from sweat, come from a lot of different things. But it's actually not uncommon for something that people have touched to find trace amounts of those elements. So I'm not terribly surprised at all of this. What you'll see down in this corner is it, we have our little element, uh, our periodic table. Anything labeled green is stuff that it has identified for us. Um, and you can see green means identified. We don't have any yellows in here, but yellow means that the computer thinks it's possible that element is there, but it was not able to verify it. So you won't see it on the graph, but you will see it labeled in yellow down here in the corner. These darker gray, um, that is called excluded, meaning that it's not even looking for those elements. It is not looking for any of these uh, noble gases. Um, you actually can't see noble gases with an EDS detector. It is also not looking for lithium. Let's say that I had gold sputtered my sample, so I knew there was gold on there and I wanted it to ignore the gold. If I right click on the gold right here, I can click excluded and it would remove any traces of gold from my graph here. Um, this last option here, the rest of these aren't particularly useful, but this last option, this pink option, is always identified. That means that we are forcing the software to see a particular element. Let's say that I know that there is nickel in this sample. I can label it as always identified. And what it did is it just added nickel, you can see NI right here, to my graph, and it has kind of forced that into the graph. Now, there isn't any actual nickel. If you look, nickel is labeled here and here, and there are no actual bumps there. So that was a poor choice on my part. Um, but you can force elements. So I'm gonna pull that one back off. These yellow lines right here correspond to whatever element is selected on the periodic table. So right now I have nickel, so they're showing where I should see peaks if there's nickel. If I click on copper, you can see they've moved the lines, and these yellow lines now match really nicely with my scan itself. So you can see there are lines where there should be bumps. If you don't like those, there is a way to get rid of them, and I'll show you that in a second. This blue line is called our cursor. Um, up here in the top corner, you can see the location of the cursor is about 5 keV, and the number of counts in that location is 36. If I move this over to my copper, you can see there are actually 3,550 counts on top of my copper. So you can see how many counts are in that particular location. You can also see what x-axis position you are on, so that's basically your elite basically your X and Y. Um, when I move my cursor around, we get little blue corners on certain locations on the periodic table. These blue corners mean that these two elements have a peak that is near my cursor. If I put my cursor way out here in the middle of nowhere, it looks like iodine has a peak that is near this location right here. This is really useful for identifying things that you're not sure what they are. For example, we've got sort of like a hump and then the rest of the peak. I'm gonna zoom in here with my, um, the zoom in happens with your uh, scroll wheel on the mouse right here. I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna hold it over the peak. When I was zoomed out, you could see that peak was not actually labeled. Um, but now that I'm zoomed in, it has labeled itself. But if I wanted to try to identify what this peak might be, I can hold my cursor over it, and it'll tell me iron, cobalt, and nickel all have peaks that are near that location. One peak is not enough, though. Um, we know that nickel has a peak near that location, but we also know that these two peaks are completely missing. That means that nickel is not a good match for our sample. Cobalt is the same way. It may look like it matches 
approximately here, but we are completely missing everything else, meaning it's a poor match. And we're gonna see the same with iron. So you wanna make sure, just like with copper, that we have several points that corroborate the element being in there. So we've got a peak here, and we've got these two peaks here. Um, everything lines up pretty nicely, so that's most likely copper. Again, this is a penny, I'm not surprised. Um, so that's the periodic table, how to interact with that. This right here is going to be the results from the spectrum. So what weight percents we have. Looks like we have about 4% carbon, 4-ish percent oxygen as well. Aluminum, chlorine, and potassium are all less than 1%. Depending on your sample and the level of knowledge that you have about your sample, I would disregard these. Like I said, it's pretty common for those to come from something that people have touched, so maybe I, because I know where those could come from, I will keep those. But anything that is less than 1% is too small for our detector to reliably see. Um, unless you have some sort of calibration standard, I would not recommend reporting aluminum, chlorine, or potassium because they are all less than 1%. And then finally, copper, awesome looking. So if you wanted to keep these out of the equation, what we could do is we could exclude aluminum, exclude potassium, and exclude chlorine. You'll notice that does not remove them from our table here. What we need to do is come over here to spectrum processing and click process. Um, that ident setup, that's going to be for the graph quant setup is going to be for the table. So clicking process will reprocess the table, and now it has removed those three elements that I excluded. Actually four, because gold, but it wasn't in there anyway. So that has redone the weight percents. We've still got about 4% of these two, um, but now it's given a little bit more weight to copper um, being in there. Weight percent is the most common that people would like. However, if you click on options, you can look at lots of different um, bits of information. So ZAF factor, that's a correction factor to determine error. We've got atomic percent, that's pretty common. Um, some of these, especially the ones along this side right here, are for use with a WDS detector. That is not something that we have. So where it is asking about cations, compounds, chemical formula, etc., cetera, um, that is for a WDS detector. Ours is only an EDS detector. So we are only looking at elements um, rather than WDS does phases. So we can see a weight percent and atomic percent. You can see intensity or net counts, that kind of thing. But now our uh, table's gotten a little more complex. We've got 4% by weight of carbon We've got about 17% by atoms present on the surface of carbon. If you want to copy this, you can click on element to select the entirety of the graph, control C on the keyboard to copy it, and then control V on Word or anywhere else to paste it. Um, you can also put it into Excel um, if you prefer to organize that way. To export this data to a Word document, um, which will give you this graph plus this table, you click the little Word document right here. That is going to open up a Word document, and we'll zoom into that, and in landscape format it will give us a picture of the table, or the a picture of the graph, as well as the table of results right here. You can also send to PowerPoint if you prefer that method. Word PowerPoint. Ooh. Okay, next we're going to move on to, well, one thing before I go on to point ID. If you want to start another spectrum, you can move to a new location or stay in the same location. You just click Start Spectrum. It saves all of these parameters that you did, so we don't have to rerun those. 
we can just click Start Spectrum, and it will give us a secondary spectrum. It's going to prompt me again to make sure that my magnification and working distance are correct. They haven't changed since I was last using this, so I'm going to keep them the same. Obviously, since I haven't moved, this is going to be the exact same image as we had previous. Although this time, I guess it's trying to give us bromine. Oh, probably because we have these um, removed. And there it goes. Bye. So there we go. We've got our new weight percents. Pretty similar to before. About 4, about 4, and about 92. Um, you can see down in this bottom corner, now I have got two, um, we've got base one and base two. You can rename them by clicking on the little A button, so I can call this something different than base two. You also can overlay them by clicking on this button, which will allow you to select multiple, and you can overlay them to compare. While they're overlaid, I can normalize them to uh, say their maximum if we have different maxima. Uh, that makes the copper peak look the same on both of them, so you can compare the other peaks. And that is the end of Spectrum. Next, on to Point ID. So, Point ID is going to take an image, uh, it's going to take the image from our um, imaging software, and we're going to be able to select points on the, uh, on the image, and it will take spectra, uh, just like this graph here, at those individual points. So, we're going to go to point ID, we are going to, um, sorry, you don't have to click on that. We are going to click on the little drop down button here and we're going to just click high resolution and click get image. Before we do that, we do want to make sure that we've got a nice focused image on our analysis software. You also want to make sure that the brightness and contrast and rotation and all of that is set the way you want it since it will just pull the information directly from your, uh, from the imaging software. You also want to make sure that these values, the magnification and the working distance, are correct. As a reminder, working distance is found here, magnification is found here, so you can see ours is correct. If those are not correct, then this scale bar, which is now on your image, will be incorrect. For some people that doesn't matter, but if you're going to put this to a Word document and send this to your boss, it might be a little confusing if this scale bar is incorrect. So it helps to make sure that those are properly input. To change them, you click on either one, on the magnification or working distance. That'll bring up the dialog box and you can change the magnification and you can change the working distance. Now that we've got our image, we're going to choose where on the image we want, um, we want results. So you can see I have point selected and all of these are deselected. I am interested in what that particle is, and I'm interested what that particle is not. So I'm going to put two points here. A thing to be, to be aware of when taking um, point ID, or this will be useful in mapping as well, is that our EDS detector is actually on the left side of our sample. So as far as the physical setup of the SEM, the EDS detector is on the left side. If I have a massive ridge right here, or my sample is sloping downward where this is higher than that, I'm going to get very poor results on this side because we essentially get a shadow cast by this ridge that's right here. If you have something like that, um, something that is sloping or ridges that you want to see behind, I would recommend during sample prep making sure that your sample is tilted and when you load it into the SEM, make sure that the face is tilted toward the left side. That's going to minimize the shadowing that you get on your EDS results. So I've got my two points. Um, and you can choose as many as you want. You honestly could choose infinite points. You will be sitting here for an infinite amount of time, but it's possible. 
Next, we're going to click on the gear next to Start Spectrum, and we're going to set these values up. These are the exact same as the Spectrum values. This is how long it's going to collect, either by time or by maximum peak. This is our x-axis, what data it's going to collect, and our time constant being set to rate one. These will carry over from Spectrum, so if you've already done a Spectrum, then these will already be set to the values that you would like. Otherwise, set them as you would like now. Then click Start Spectrum. Start Spectrum is going to start with point one. It's going to collect information from point one. Once point one has gone through its 30 seconds, it is going to move automatically on to point number two and so on until it has finished all of the points on your image. So point one, two, three, etc. So this one can potentially take a little while depending on how you set up your termination criteria. So there was the end of point one and now it is just collecting on point two. Once this completes, we are going to see base 3, that is in reference to this image. This image is now called base 3. Um, we can rename it by clicking this little A with the uh, cursor picture. Um, processing, there we go. Under this image we have two points, point 1 and point 2. Um, I am going to identify these three that I unidentified and I'm going to set this one to inactive. Um, another thing I can do is hit clear and clear all and that will set me back to zero and then click identify and that will go to kind of the, the default what it wants to identify for us. So I've got quite a few things. This is point one which is on our dark spot. Um, my guess is that this is probably a speck of dust. A whole lot of carbon, some oxygen. We are still getting some copper. That is probably because this dust is not very thick and we're seeing copper through the spot. And then there's aluminum, silicon, sulfur, chlorine, uh, potassium, calcium. Um, all of these things are pretty common in sweat or water or um, other contamination that just happens to be um, in the air and on our skin and such. So these are not particularly surprising. If I saw uranium, I'd be worried, but these are normal. Um, you can see, just like before, we've got weight percent all along here. Um, Zaf factor, which I'm going to pull out for the sake of having a little bit cleaner looking graph. And we've got atomic percent. Silicon is uh, silicon and chlorine are both less than 1%. Sulfur and potassium are both exactly at 1%. All four of those are a little bit within an uncertain zone. Um, silicon especially, um, with chlorine following, and then this sulfur and this potassium. Because those are such low values, I would want to verify that they are in there somehow. Probably the best way to do that would be to zoom in to this section only, so I'm getting a lot less um, around it. And I would collect a couple of points from within this uh, spec. But here we've got all of our information, a whole lot of carbon, pretty, pretty sure that's dust. Um, we can also look at point two. And if we wanted to, we could compare them by clicking this little compare button, select points one and two, and I'm gonna normalize them so that they have the same maximum. Um, but you can see there is um, you know, a pretty big difference between the elements that we're seeing in all of these.
if you need to change things here um, on the screen, we've got the spectrum processing. You can reprocess the graph or you can reprocess the table. Image settings, this is going to be to change your actual image, this one that we're calling base three. Um, you can change uh, mode, contrast, brightness, and gamma. You're welcome to play around with those if your image is a little weird on uh, the contrast scale. And then spectrum settings, um, I should have showed this in spectrum mode also. But spectrum settings, this is um, how you can change sort of the look of this. Please don't mess with the actual look of the spectrum. This black and this gray right here are the most conducive to printing on a Word document as well as exporting to make it in the various formats to make it accessible. However, down here you can choose whether to show KLMs or not. Those are these goldish colored lines um, that occur when you select an element. So if I turn that off, you can see those are no longer there, um, which sometimes they are a little distracting. Actually on this Word document that we exported, you can see there's that line right in the middle of the graph. <clears throat> and that can be distracting to certain, <clears throat> to certain reports if you're giving uh, reports to higher level uh, management and that kind of thing. So we can turn those off. This blue line, you could move all the way over to the side, or you could actually turn off the cursor. That means that it is no longer there as well, and that's gonna clean up the look of your graph also. Right, so the last one is spectral imaging. This is most commonly called mapping. Um, and apparently we're gonna take our time getting to the mapping screen. So this software is decent, um, but we have had troubles in the past with bugs, um, with it shutting down unexpectedly, so I apologize if that's about to happen. Um, also, spectral imaging is a massive amount of data. Um, you are getting a whole lot of information to the detector, and the detector is putting it in a very expensive format, which is images. We're getting several images out of this. That means that spectral imaging makes a really large file. And unfortunately, that often means that when we do get bugs, it's in spectral imaging. So what you wanna do is make sure that you are saving regularly um, while we're doing spectral imaging. So usually after I collect data, I will send directly to Word or PowerPoint. So I have just a quick record of what I did, just in case the software um, decides to shut down for being too big of a file. It also means that while we were able to rename the scans that we take in Spectrum and Point ID by clicking on this button, in Spectral Imaging we are not able to do that. For some reason there is a bug that does not allow us to rename our spectra, um, so you just have to kind of know what base 4 means. If it helps, you can keep a log of that either in the Word document that you're creating or um, somewhere else. But what we're gonna do first with spectral imaging, again, we're gonna verify that our magnification and working distance are set to the same values as our imaging software. Working distance, magnification. To change those again, you just click on them. It'll bring up our dialog box and you can change those values. Then we are going to click on the down arrow of get image, click high resolution, and then click Get Image. That will get a nice, fresh image. Despite the fact that I haven't moved my software, the image that was displayed here just a minute ago was not a fresh image, uh, meaning that it won't allow me to take a map of that. So you do have to get a nice, fresh, new image, um, usually within the last minute or so, um, in order to do mapping. Next, we are going to click on the gear next to Start Map. This is going to be slightly different from the other times that we have clicked the gear here because mapping has a little bit different parameters than just a graph. We are going to choose resolution to be 256 by 192, frame time to be fastest, 
And for the first sample, we are going to choose number of frames to be infinite. That means that it will keep collecting data until I tell it to stop. Um, oddly, I have had times when it times out on infinite, where it reached about 500 frames and decided that 500 was equal to infinity. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it defines that value, but infinite is nearly infinite. Um, it will keep going until it just decides that it's done, um, which could be hours. So we'll just keep an eye on it with infinite. If you're running a sample that you know that 50 frames is going to be sufficient for the scan or the quality that you're looking for, go ahead and choose whatever value. You can also type in here, so you can say like, I want 184 frames, if you know that that is where you get good enough data. Um, this is very much a balance between the time you have available and the quality that you want. In all of science, there is a trade-off. You either get really high quality or you get it fast and you typically can't get both. So in this case, you're going to you know, make a balance between how much time you have to spend on this project and the quality of data that you want. You find that line. Energy range, this is the same as before, and time constant, same as before. So 200 to auto and rate one. Once we have these set up, we're gonna click start map and that is going to go into collecting. So first we've got sort of a low pixel gray image and then it's gonna start giving us these dots that show where um, the elements are located. From our point scan earlier, we know that this spec is mostly carbon and the stuff around it is mostly copper. And you can already see that developing. We've got a little bit of a hole here in the pink of the copper. And we've got a slightly more dense carbon region here toward the middle. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep an eye on the number of frames. And when these are looking good enough for our results, we can click stop map. Because I put this on infinite, um, it's basically going to go forever. It seems to think that will take 35 minutes to reach forever, um, but this is not an accurate countdown here. So we're just gonna let it collect. The best way to tell when something is good enough and you can create your own you know, requirements or restrictions for what determines good enough, but typically what we look at is this little number up in the top corner. So you can see aluminum has a three, copper has a six. Um, actually, it looks like all of them have threes. Um, that value is going to slowly go up. This is uh, related to, it is not the exact same as, but it is related to the number of x-rays that our detector has received for this particular element. Um, none of them have gone up since I pointed them out to you, but you will notice these numbers go up gradually. Once a number has hit 10, oh there we go, 7 now on copper, where we had 6 a minute ago. Once this number reaches 10, usually you have a pretty good idea of where the elements are reliably. Um, so whatever elements you're most interested in, let's say I'm most interested in my carbon here, I would want to wait for that to reach 10. And depending on how much of your material has that element in it, this could take quite a while. So you just want to keep an eye on the number of frames, uh, keep an eye on these values, and when you are happy with it, click stop and make a note of how many frames it took for you to get there. From this point forward, I can probably use that number of frames here instead of infinite. That means that I don't have to watch quite as carefully um, while it's collecting data. For the first one though, you do want to watch carefully and make sure that it's collecting properly. If it's popping up things that you find ridiculous, um, you're absolutely certain that, say, sulfur is not on the surface of the sample. During the collection, you can come over here, right click on any of the elements, and exclude them. If you absolutely want it to show other elements, you can also right click on any of these elements and uh, select them as always identified. If you select it as identified, the computer will, be, will have the power to undo 
the work, the, uh, the selection that you've made. Um, so if you want to force the computer into identifying or not identifying something, I'd recommend using excluded and always identified rather than the green identified. Once you have reached the satisfactory number of um, counts, and you can see I identified a lot more elements as it went along. This ended up taking about 550 frames before it reached 10 on my carbon. And what I was hoping for was to see the carbon and the copper, since we know those are the two kind of main elements in the colors that we're seeing here. I was hoping to get both of those above 10. So um, that took quite a long time. Um, once I reached, um, you can see I missed 10, but once I reached a little over 10, I just went over here and I clicked this button which said stop map. Um, what that did is that stopped and now you can see here's all of our results. Most everything is over 10. We've got a couple of elements, this potassium, calcium, sulfur, um, which are below 10, but pretty much all of this is pretty close to 10 or above 10, so that's pretty nice. And you can see really clearly where we've got these regions of more of the carbon. Um, you can see oxygen as well. We've got maybe some scratches here that are more oxygenated. Um, got a chunk of magnesium over here in the corner. So you can see these sort of bright spots. Um, chlorine is kind of interesting. Got a little specks kind of all over. And then copper, you can see the holes in uh, each of those things that correspond to darker spots of other elements. Now, a problem that we have here a little bit is that we have some, some duplicating colors. So we've got uh, pink here and also pink here. If I care about chlorine and copper, um, I'm going to have issues trying to show an overlay. Now this is something that once you export these images, you can put them into Photoshop and change their colors. That's also something that I can do here. Um, so we're going to kind of go through these buttons over here and I'll show you how to use those. With map processing, if at any point you are not seeing these images or you want to add different elements to the images, that would be map processing. We process by counts and then you click process and that will um, refresh these images basically. Image filters, um, that is going to be, um, I guess, filters that you can put on them. Uh, I don't usually do these, um, I don't mess with it too much, but you're welcome to play around with it um, to kind of change the way these dots appear if you prefer uh, a different look to them. Image settings, I use this one quite a bit. Um, you can choose to change the image settings for the Electrum image, which that is this black and white image here, for all maps, which is going to be all of these, or a selected map, such as the copper or the chlorine. I like the copper, well, let's change the copper to like orange or something. So I'm going to select this map, go to image settings, selected map, and we can change our map color. We've got some default colors right here. Um, earth and thermal are nonsense, don't use them. We also can use custom though. So I'm gonna change to custom. You can see that change instead of from black to pink, which it was previously, now we have white to red. I prefer my background to always be black. So I'm gonna click black there. And then instead of red, I'm gonna say, let's do a nice orange. So now copper is a nice orange color. And if we wanted to overlay our chlorine and our copper, um, we could do so without worrying about the colors uh, looking significantly similar. Um, you can do that to all of the ones. You can see we've got three different reds here. We've got two cyans and we've got two greens. So you can adjust each of those to their own color. Um, the dark blue that you can see the calcium has, I really struggle with this one. This one does not show up well. If you plan on manipulating this later in Photoshop or some other um, processing software, you're welcome to keep it as blue. Um, but most people have a really hard time distinguishing between blue and black, and so this doesn't show up well uh, if you're trying to print it or put it in a report. 
Um, another thing that you can do is you'll notice that these are kind of faint, especially that's uh, visible in the carbon here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to all maps and I'm going to put it in hot pixel suppression mode. Hot pixel suppression mode is going to brighten all of these up, which sometimes is good, sometimes is bad, um, sometimes maybe you don't want that, but that makes it a lot easier to see the bright and the dark spots compared to auto mode, which just makes them a little darker. Um, this is gonna take more ink to print. It also makes these elements appear like they're very present um, when we're in auto mode, you can see we can, we're not getting a ton of counts of these particular elements. But hot pixel suppression is nice for when you're trying to overlay these. If you do want to overlay, so I was using the example of, well, let's do uh, our carbon and our copper. I'm gonna click on the copper. And you can see that added orange to all of the locations on this gray image where we have copper. And I'm gonna click carbon. We've got the same thing here. So now we've got orange and red. Orange and red are pretty similar, so maybe this isn't a perfect matchup of colors. But you can see very clearly, here are the red spots, here are the orange spots, and we've got little chunks of material. Now this one, you can see, is not really labeled by red or orange. And actually, looking over our maps, it looks like magnesium and silicon are actually a pretty good um, representation of what that spec is. So I'm going to add magnesium to it as well. You can see that covered this area with blue. It also covered the whole rest of the area with blue because there is, um, you know, a little bit of magnesium just kind of scattered over the surface. Um, so that did dull our carbon um, representation on some of this. So the overlays are not perfect, but it does help you see boundaries between materials um, as well as line up um, where there might be holes in certain elements, just like there was that hole with the copper right here. Um, so that was image settings right there. Um, you can also, if you have played around with the colors and you don't like how it's looking, you can click reset colors and that'll set to kind of a default color scheme. You're still gonna have duplicates though, so I would recommend going through and making sure that you have gotten rid of any of the duplicates that are going to bother you or going to make um, problems for you. Spectrum processing right here, this has to do with the graph that we have created. Um, so you can kind of mess with what that's doing. And then spectrum settings, this is just like before where you can turn on and off the cursor you can show KLMs or not, etc. Again, that's messing with this spectrum or this graph down here. Um, so, by default, it's going to show the spectrum. However, you can click through, we can look at weight percent. So this is the table of weight percent. To copy this over, we can click on it um, and then copy and paste it into say Excel. And then charts, this is showing a uh, weight percent and you can see everything is extremely low except for copper, which is entirely unsurprising. Um, usually before I go messing around with any of these things, I will just quickly send my results to Word or to PowerPoint, whichever one I'm using. Um, occasionally, I will get an error like this that says the clipboard is empty or not valid. Like I mentioned, there are a couple bugs in this software and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, but just go ahead and click OK and try again. Usually, it will not do that error thing more than once or twice. Um, you just kind of have to keep trying. Because I had the Word document open from earlier, it's going to actually send all of this to the same Word document. If I had closed the Word document from earlier, it would create a new Word document. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll out a little bit. So this is from our spectrum that we exported earlier. And then it has created all of these pages here, which have the maps, as well as the gray image scan right here. 
Um, this page, you will notice, is identical to this page. We've got our carbon, oxygen, magnesium, carbon, oxygen, magnesium. This is the page that it exported before it showed me that little error box. So often you're going to have to delete um, a little bit um, where it exported a certain amount and then failed. You'll also notice that there are blank pages in here. Um, that's due to these pages being slightly smaller than Pathfinder expects. So what it does is it puts what's called a page break at the end of this page, but because this page is a little smaller, the page break actually cuts over onto the next page, and we go to the next page after a page break. So we've got sort of these, um, and I apologize, I've got sort of a thing on. So we get sort of these blank pages. If you click kind of toward the middle of the blank page and you put backspace and then delete, that will bring everything from this page over. So click in the middle of the empty page, backspace, delete, that'll bring the next page over to here. Um, so you don't have those kind of awkward uh, spaces in between everything. The last page, and I'll zoom back in, so after the pages with all of the maps individually. The last page is going to have the graph or the spectrum. If in Pathfinder you have, we're showing something different here, it will export something different. So it would export this information or uh, the weight percent information, I believe. Um, with any of this, if you want to export individually, you can go to um, Edit, Copy, and you can paste it uh, elsewhere. As I mentioned before, you are unable to rename this to something more useful. Um, so I like to keep a note, usually in this Word document. Um, they give you this nice text box and you can add information like where, here I'll zoom in so we can actually see what I'm typing here. Um, you can say this was bottom left of back of penny. Um, just to kind of keep a note of where we were, since base 4 is not particularly informative on uh, what we were doing there. Um, when you get multiple maps, or if you go to another screen and then come back to mapping, which we will give it its time to do, you will often find... There we go you'll often find that the colored maps have disappeared. Um, this does not mean that the data is lost. This just means that um, it, has, it isn't showing those uh, currently. So what you want to do is go to Map Processing, Process by Counts, and then click Process. That's going to take all of the data from this uh, periodic table. It's going to bring it back up. Our colors have been lost, unfortunately, um, and the uh, hot pixel suppression has gone dormant, so we're back now. Um, but those maps aren't gone. So if you go back and forth between various maps and you notice that these colored maps are gone, that's you just have to go back to map processing and process by counts. Um, once you have everything kind of saved as you want it from Spectrum, Point ID, and Spectral Imaging. You can go ahead and close the software and it will prompt you to save. These two with just an, an EMSA, those are both the spectrums, they're the spectra that we took. This PS is for point scan and this is the map. So we took four uh, scans of my, our sample altogether um, the selected bit means that we are going to save the information from those files. That means that later if we open up this project, these will all be present. If you don't want to save them, you do not have to, but you did already create the project, so you may as well save the results to the project. So we'll just click go OK, and I will show you what it looks like. So we just created this. Penny EDS, and it looks just like any of the other folders, but because I put that EDS designation on there, I know that it's a project folder, 
not just uh, a folder containing a bunch of pictures. So if I open this up, most of this is nonsense. There are, is not a lot in these uh, folders that you're going to need to use. However, this is my Word document. This is where I exported everything. You can see it's stamped with the date and the time that I started the uh, document. So that was at 2.50 this afternoon that I started this document. Um, and then, um, again, underneath each of these, there isn't much that you're going to really need to pay attention to other than know, you know that they are there. What's nice is all of these weird files are read by Pathfinder. So if you realize that your Word document does not have everything you want, or you want to export additional things, you can reopen Pathfinder, reopen this project, and all of that data is still going to be there. If you get a project that has a ton of maps, um, I'm talking like probably four or more maps, you get a higher likelihood that it's going to start forgetting map data, um, which is a little frustrating. Um, the data is still there, it just doesn't self-identify quite as easily, um, which, in which case having this Word document where you already know what elements are present are going to be very helpful. Um, you can kind of work backwards if there are issues with that. As a reminder, push your chairs back under the desk, throw away all used Kim wipes and gloves, and take your samples with you as you leave. Please also remember to not use any personal USB sticks in the lab computers. To save your results, if the computer is connected to the internet, open Google Chrome, go to gmail.com, and email the results to yourself using the lab account. If the lab account is logged out, please ask staff to log you in. If no staff are present, a personal account may be used. Please do not log out of the lab account. If the computer is not connected to the internet, find an MCL-owned USB, usually a metallic blue color. Copy your data from the computer onto the USB. Then use any internet-connected computer in the lab to email the data to yourself. Please do not put the MCL USBs into your personal computer. Once you have completed this training video, email lab staff at characterization.uofu at gmail.com to schedule a one-hour follow-up training session called an observation. Bring your sample to the MCL at the scheduled time, and staff will watch and assist as needed for the first hour of your machine use. After you have successfully completed the observation hour, you are authorized to schedule time on this machine in the MCL for independent use.